We know that in the world today, there are spas and there are slums. Now, a question that I have for you is why are the slum dwellers not storming the spas? But we know now that there's tension between the non-land-owning class and the land-owning class. And what was this tension? Well, the tension is that one owned property and another did not. And there was concern on the part of the land-owning class that workers and peasants were going to take the things that they possessed. <coughs> so what they did in Britain was say, no, what we are going to use is criminal law. How so? We're going to establish a number of capital crimes. And these crimes were, for the most part, property-related crimes. Now you have Douglas Hay, legal historian. What he was saying is that you had the parliament, legislators, that were using criminal law as a way of terrorizing the working poor so as to ensure that they abide by the law. So as to ensure that they respect the property rights of the landowning class. <coughs> Now, what's the theory behind it? Well, the more severe the punishment, the more likely people are to obey. We had an increase in the number of capital crimes. Now, despite many people being convicted for these capital crimes, very few people were being executed. Mass executions would have led to the opposite outcome that was desired by the landowning class. So what was the landowning class after? Protection of proprietary rights. To protect their proprietary rights, they need a certain respect for the law. Imagine historically, you're living in your little village, and all of a sudden, the king's court comes through with all this pomp and circumstance, and trumpets, and fanfare. And they're coming in, and they're wearing robes, all kinds of regalia, and they're wearing wigs. And they're passing judgment on these now criminals. That carried a certain weight among the populace. That in itself was so impressive, the majesty of the law had a deterrent effect without the carrying out of the executions. Law has a dual effect. Now on one hand, we have law's oppressive power. So we know that law's oppressive force can be used to elicit obedience, compliance. Why? We're afraid of being punished, so we obey. But on the other hand, there is the belief in law's justice. And that, what Doug Hay refers to as illusion of fairness, also encourages compliance. So what you have then is a balance between coercion and consent. So if you were to use coercive power, alone, then that is a recipe for an uprising. But if you can get people to consent, then the chances of an uprising diminish significantly. What we're saying then is that capital convictions were necessary because what we're trying to do is to discourage property crimes. So the convictions were necessary. There is now the fear that I am going to be put to death. But then mercy came in and I was spared. And what that mercy did was far more powerful than the capital convictions because the mercy encouraged everyone else to believe that ultimately the law is fair and the law is just. The point is that people believe that justice will prevail. 
an innocent person cannot be executed. This cannot happen. Because if it does happen, then it means the entire system is flawed. We have a dole bludger and we have a tax evader. Both of them are stealing from the system. But if we were to look at the media, and if we were to look at politicians, we see a bit of a double standard. So if we look at it and we look at media representations, popular representations, of how people regard dole bludgers versus tax evaders, what we find is that dole bludgers are often represented in a very negative light. A negative light will often involve accusations of laziness, drug addiction, bad parenting, the list goes on. Parasites, leeches upon society. We're a little more sympathetic towards tax evaders. Now tax evasion is fraud, just like dole bludging is fraud. But the representation ends up being extremely negative on one side and not as negative on the other. So here we have two groups of people who are ostensibly doing the same thing, cheating the system. But the act itself is not what we're concerned with. Because if the act itself were what we were concerned with, then both would be punished based on the harm they've caused to society, the injury. Now what are we concerned with? What, is, what are we regarding as deviant here? Is the act of cheating the system deviance? Or does it depend on the individual who's committing the act? And that's more a rhetorical question for you to think about. The point is, what we regard as injurious behavior to society depends not on the act itself, but rather who's committing the act and who we believe to be harmed by the act. Now the question that I have for you is whether or not the majesty of the law is alive today. There is nothing which so generally strikes the imagination and engages the affections of mankind as the right of property. That law of property which nature herself has written upon the hearts of all mankind. So it's not family or community or even love that was written in the hearts of mankind. It was the desire for property. <coughs> 